Very excited, delighted to have this next guest right here on Next Week. Uh, he is uh, David Bonson. He's the founder, managing partner, and chief investment officer of the Bonson Group, a bi-coastal private wealth management boutique based in Newport Beach, California. He, uh, he actually has, is often seen on CNBC, Fox Business, and Bloomberg, and is a regular contributor to National Review and Forbes. He is also the son of of uh, one of my heroes of the faith, uh, Dr. Greg Bonson, the man who has uh, impacted me and my ministry greatly. So please welcome David Bonson, everybody. <laughs> What's up, David? Welcome. Can you hear me, David? I can. I apologize. I had the mute on. Great to be with you. Thanks, brother, so much. Uh, so I'm excited, very excited. Of course, um, uh, I'm, I'm very familiar with, with yourself, with your work. I, I had just an amazing time, David. Uh, my very favorite talk from the conference a couple of years ago, the Bonson Conference in honor of your father. My favorite talk was yours. Um, it was just so encouraging to hear and to listen to all the stuff with your dad and how much he, he just really dramatically impacted your own life. Well, I, I appreciate that, and it was it, it was actually um, I give a lot of speeches, and I, I've spoken all over the country for many years now on a whole lot of different topics. But that uh, speech was one of my favorite to give as well. It was obviously a little bit more um, emotional and a little more personal than going and talking about uh, the economy or investment markets or something like that, which is what I routinely speak on. But it was uh, a memorable um, opportunity, and and great to be with other people uh, who were impacted by dad's teaching ministry. Yeah, and your dad, of course, was a prolific writer and, and speaker. I mean, my goodness, David, I, I'm taking a look at some of your dad's like lecture series, and I don't, I don't know how your dad even slept or ate. Um, uh, but the reason I bring that up is, is now you have this, this important book. It's called Crisis of responsibility, so you're following in some ways a lot of, uh, I think I think impacted by so much of what your dad did. You are a bright man, intelligent, you care a lot about what's going on around you, and now you've written this book. Tell me about the book, David. Why, why did you write it? What's the underlying point of the book? Well, the, the kind of short version background is that um, I, I work as an investment manager. At the time of the financial crisis, I was a managing director at one of the largest investment banks on Wall Street, Morgan Stanley. And the financial crisis was an event that obviously profoundly affected our society, affected a lot of people in a lot of different sectors in terms of uh, its economic impact and, and, and I think a lot of cultural ramifications as well. But myself professionally kind of living through it, it, it particularly uh, was something that, that impacted me and motivated me to understand it better. And I, I, um, pursued a pretty aggressive project of, of studying and analyzing the, the financial crisis, its causes, and what I thought would be the right things to prevent it from happening again. And, and unfortunately, as is the case often, a lot of the um, material and a lot of the other perspectives that existed out there uh, I found to be lacking, sometimes just dead wrong, and that, that happens a lot, and that, that's actually kind of easier to deal with. But the major strand I ran into was the um, incomplete analysis. In other words, someone on the left maybe being critical of, of the banking system or Wall Street um, or, or corporate greed or something like that. And they kind of had it. They kind of were on to something, but, but I thought fell short of, of closing the circle. And then on the right, I think that there was a significant amount of incomplete analysis they didn't necessarily go after Wall Street or or greed or capitalism the way the left did, but they went after government housing policy, Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac. Uh, oftentimes, the Federal Reserve was a favorite little target. But what both sides were doing uh, wrong, or what the both sides were not doing, was was providing um, any analysis of Main Street's culpability in the crisis. Okay. And in, and in fact, I would say it was the opposite. They were actually starting off with the premise. Their sort of presupposition was that Main Street was the uh, victim, and, and and my analysis was abundantly clear that Main Street was largely the perpetrator of the financial crisis, not in a way that vindicated other bad actors, government policy or, or ex excesses and Wall Street leverage, but the narrative was dead wrong. 
And, and it, it struck me that far more than even an economic story, which is my area of professional interest and, and passion, but I ran into a gigantic moral narrative. We have a society that in 17 years since the savings and loan crisis, by 2008, I don't consider 17 years a, a super long period of time, right. but all of a sudden it became not just okay to walk away from bills and financial obligations, liabilities, the one was perfectly capable of living up to, it, even worse than the fact that people are so comfortable with that, uh, that decision making, it became a source of pride. It became something people could go to the bar on Friday night and brag about. Right. And, and so what exactly it was that had created this kind of very rapid um, degradation of our own character and, and that moral climate was, was of great concern to me. So I wanted to write a book about the financial crisis that told the full cultural story that really looked to evaluate Main Street's culpability and how the uh, covetousness and the sort of 10th commandment violation that I think was systemic across Wall Street was, in fact, uh, uh, very well marinated across Main Street as well. Then in 2016, my agent and, and publisher came to me and said, look, what do you think about taking that exact concept, this, this story, this thread that you're writing uh, around the financial crisis, but applying it in an even broader sense, applying it to other issues that at the time were quite hot and in fact haven't cooled down at all around free trade, around immigration, around housing policy, uh, the jobs market, uh, education was a big issue, the size of government. So you have a lot of these socio-political issues that are of great concern to a lot of interested people, but um, I don't think that those uh, issues are often really analyzed from the standpoint of of our individual bottom-up obligations as a member of, of American society. Right. And so my premise became, and, and what I attempt to you know, establish throughout the book and hopefully provide some early levels of remedy and discussion, is the fact that we have a crisis of responsibility that begins with ourselves. Well, that's powerful. I think, of course, and, and I think you've, you've addressed that, in terms of how we handle things Today, in this modern society, we look at a particular groups responsible or it's always somebody else, some other organization, yeah. and there's not a lot of um, intimate uh, personal analysis over our own failures, and I think you've, you've nailed it, and that gets ignored. So in, in terms of writing this book, Crisis of Responsibility, the, the main thrust of it is talking about the moral responsibility of individuals and failures and those sorts of things. So what is... Uh, when you talk about a solution, David, what is the solution that you offer? Well, I mean, I, I attempt in the final two chapters of the book to divide it up between chapter 11 is a sort of uh, individual personal checklist of, of starting points of things people may be able to do to address that responsibility deficit that, uh, that begins at home. And then chapter 12, the final chapter of the book, is uh, applying it more to the macro level, uh, uh, the broader standpoint across all society. So there is a top 10 list in Chapter 11 of the uh, the 10 things I'm recommending people can kind of do to begin this process. Uh, before I even go to some of those particular remedies, I'll highlight a couple for you to save time. But look, the, the very first thing I have to say is that we have to start off by acknowledging the problem itself. I think that most uh, – recovery programs are really onto something. The recovery can't begin unless there's at least the acknowledgement of a problem. And I'm not sure that we have really come to terms with the fact that there is, in fact, this crisis of responsibility. And that blame casting is, in fact, the, the issue that I think we most need to deal with as a starting point. Well, I kind of have been raised believing and seeing and, and, and feeling very much um, in the, that the left often, I think, is in a sort of victimology complex. Right. There's this yeah. heavy uh, um, identity politics. Um, they're very comfortable building a framework for how they view society around um, race, gender, and class. I think that there's a significant Marxian thread that is very prone to class envy. That's right. So, so victimhood is, is systemic in a lot of um, progressivism. But I, I'm sorry, I don't believe that, that they have a monopoly on blame casting. I think that the right has become in recent years equally guilty of, of such 
often um, around the fact that our government is so large and so reckless and so uh, ill-suited for the the dealing with the policy needs of the day. Um, our critiques of government are certainly spot on in that regard, but I believe they get the cause and effect totally wrong. I think we have a deficient government because we have an inadequately self-governed populace. Ah, there and, you go. Yes. And that and that became a big theme of the book that that I believe needs to be addressed. Well, you know, David, it, it's it's great to hear you say these things and and to to see the application you're aiming for. You know, uh, and I just just to talk about your dad for a second here, I, I hear all of that. I, I, I can hear so much of your dad's really amazing influence in a lot of what you're saying. You, you said even Ray's believing these. You talk about in terms of bottom up change, mm -hmm. uh, which is something your father uh, talked about all the time. Yeah. Uh, if, this, if we're ever going to see change in society, it's going to start at the heart level of the individual. And of course, your dad was pointing people towards towards Christ, towards the gospel, towards um, to God's word. And so that's powerful. Can I, can I ask you just a personal question, David? You sure may. Um, so you are now involved in some very important high-level discussions financially. The, you know, you're, you're, you're sought after as somebody who has a, a valid opinion, important opinion on a lot of uh, things going on in the world around us, especially financially. Um, when you have now entered into this position and you, you have the kind of influence you have, how has your dad's influence and all that you learned from him and just his consistency, how has that influenced you and impacted you in, in what you're doing now? Do you, do you see the world through the eyes that he gave you and has that, has that been a blessing for you? Yeah, every son sees the world largely through the eyes that their dad gave them, that their parents in the way that they were raised. But in my particular case, I think it's extra special because my dad um, was such a profound influence ideologically. I mean, as a father, uh, you, you, you want, um, you, uh, as a son, you want your father to love you, care for you. Well, I had that in spades. I had a tremendously loving and supportive dad. Um, the side of Greg Bonson that all the folks out there have read his books and heard his lectures don't know and, and never will be able to, unfortunately. But it was um, n not something I would trade away for anything in the world. And then when you couple that with the unique giftedness of Greg Bonson, the scholar, which I think is a very different category yeah. of his life than, than Greg Bonson, my, my dad. But I did, um, I did kind of get to double dip, so to speak. My dad had a profoundly um, rare work ethic. And, yes. and I very much strive um, to, I think I got that bug. I think I, I, I caught that strand of DNA, if That's you will. That's obvious, yes. Yeah. And, and so I, 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 but also like my dad, it isn't a burden for me. It's nothing really for me to brag about because it's a joy. I absolutely love waking up. I wake up very early. I love working. So it isn't a sacrifice. Yeah. Um, I know what sacrifices are and, and I seek to be sacrificial in certain cases, as my dad did, but for neither my father or myself is waking up early and working hard a sacrifice. It's what we were put on earth to do. Can you, uh, so it, can, can you just, just on that point there, David, just real fast, because it was kind of a fun thing for me. I'm aware of your, your dad's work ethic. It's inspired me a lot. As a matter of fact, I hope this is an encouragement to you, David. Um, the kind of impact we're having in this show, this show exists that you're on right now because of your dad, because of his influence mm. on me. Um, but can you just tell that quick story about how you would try to beat your dad and waking up that form of that oh, yeah. kind of discipline. Yeah, yeah that is, it is kind of a fun story. Although I got to say, I wish uh, for a whole lot of reasons he were still here, but I have him beat now. I mean, uh, I, I couldn't beat him when, when he was around. Although, although perhaps now I'm a 3:45 AM guy every morning. And, and I suspect that if that were the case, he would just go to 3:30, and then I'd have to go to 3:15 <laughs> or something. But yeah, um, there was a point. I believe I was 18. It was really, it was really just a, a year or so, a uh, year or two before Dad died, and I was ready. I was young adult and starting off life, and and all the different things that go there with. It was a summertime, and I had uh, trying to start a business, and I had you know schooling and other things going on, and and um, I, I remember like getting up at six in the morning, which was kind of early for for someone at that age, and. So I'm gonna get up and just start my day, and 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 then when um, Dad's up and so forth, uh, uh, we'll kind of get things rolling for our day. And I'd go down to his study, and he was already in there working. And I go, okay, I guess I didn't get up that early. So the next day, I said I'll get up at 5:30, and and I did it. And he he was in there working, and he didn't drink coffee, by the way. And at that time, I didn't either. Um, as early as I get up, and as consistently as I do it now, 
I'm pretty heavily dependent on coffee, but <laughs> how he did it without coffee is sort of uh, un- unfathomable to me. But I just did it like maybe, I don't know, four or five days in a row and just kept going a half hour earlier. And, and each time he was still awake. And I don't really know if he like kind of knew what I was up to and was just messing with me. <laughs> but essentially I got to like 4.30 or something and, and he was still, he would be in there. And, and I knew he wasn't up all night. I mean, he would go to bed and I was up later than him, but I, I, I knew he would gone down for the night. And he just, uh, every morning I'd get up, he, every morning he'd already be awake. Where before I never knew what time he was getting up. Um, and, and now I just said, I guess I'm not going to get to find out. I can't, I can't beat him up, but, uh, wow. I'm quite, I'm quite certain that my, uh, 345 habit that I have formed, um, would, would probably win the award now. We'll see. Probably, probably. It's just really great to see. And I think, um, and the reason why I ask is, is number one, your dad's had such a great influence on me. And I just, I love hearing the stories and I know for a lot of our listeners and viewers, it's the same for them, but a lot of what you're tackling in this book, I think comes down to the sorts of things that you're talking about in terms of uh, the family, the individual, personal responsibility. I mean, just those moral issues. I mean, you, you brought up covening, David. I mean, who talks about that anymore? You know. Oh well, well, not a lot of people do, and 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 it was very conscious to you. You know, you can talk about envy in sort of a broad sense, um, but to kind of go directly to the the Ten Commandments and and. Um, whatnot was very intentional on, on my part. Um, but maybe after a housing crisis, um, that was entirely rooted about somebody coveting thy neighbor's house, perhaps more people should talk about coveting. Yes, very, very much so. So David, I, I, I'm so appreciate what you're doing and just really, really grateful for it. You've had a, a lot of people actually plug this book. Uh, I saw John Frame even gave a plug recently, and you've got um, you've got uh, Andrew Sandlin, uh, some some solid guys that um, that that um, can be trusted and have. I mean, it's marked all up here with lots of people uh, promoting this book, and so it's Crisis of Responsibility: Our Cultural Addiction to Blame and How You Can Cure It by David Bonson. David, uh, where can people go to get the book? Where do you want them to go? Well, I mean, Amazon.com is kind of the easiest place for most people. It's at Barnes and Noble uh, as well, and BarnesandNoble.com. I don't want to pick favorites in the various choices of distribution. We appreciate all of the the brick and mortar stores. It's in fifteen hundred stores around the country. So if people are mom and pop book bookstore, you know, buyers, feel free to pick it up there. And and if they uh, prefer the Amazon deal, like a, a whole lot of book buyers do, um, it, it's done extremely well at Amazon as well. And they've had it discounted nicely for a while too. It's the price has started to come up a bit, but um, there should be no uh, challenge to finding it. And uh, we appreciate those who are interested in it. And we've been blown away and and humbled by the. The response to it so far, the the book's done very well, and and I'm really really pleased and blessed. Well, good. I'm glad you wrote it, Dave. I'm excited actually to get into it myself, um, and just uh, and just learn from it. So one more fun fact before we let you go. Uh, question: uh, Your dad, uh, surprisingly, as as a theologically rigorous as he was, I mean, people would see your dad and just think, man, that guy has just got God on his mind all the time, and just he's forgotten more theological thoughts than I'll ever have. <laughs> <laughs> um, your dad yeah. hated Christian contemporary music, correct? Like with a passion. With a passion. I'm, I'm just being gracious by putting it that way. You don't know how, how happy that made me because I felt the same way and I've almost felt sinful about it. So now that I know your dad was on my side, I'm excited about that. Has that influenced your musical choices, David? No, I, I pretty much at some point was able to formulate my own musical preferences and Dad, unfortunately, was stuck as a lot of people of his generation were with this insane idea that the Beatles were the greatest band of all time. And it's not something I would have chosen to argue about with him. But now that he's not here to whack me in the back of the head, I think most of us know that U2 was a better band than the Beatles. (laughs) All right, David. Thanks so much for spending time with us today. We look forward to talking to you again. Thanks so much. All right, guys, David Bonson, Crisis of Responsibility, guys, our cultural addiction to blame and how you can cure it. Next week with Jeff Durbin. The Late Night Show with the Unpopular Opinion. Tuesday, only on Facebook Live.